Yeah, I've started. Just let me know. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the day four afternoon session of this uh, course, uh, Fishery Oceanography for uh, Future Professionals. And uh, uh, we have been uh, uh, taking some case studies of some species, uh, apart from the processes that we have taught in the initial part of this uh, course. So we have covered uh, two species so far, Hilsa and Sardine. And today, uh, in this session, I'm going to cover uh, some case study about uh, another type of this uh, another species which is uh, having different characteristics and uh, thus its uh, oceanographic preferences so we will be uh, visiting about the like what is the physiology of uh, tuna fish which i assume that it is also of uh, much interest for many of the participants i have been seeing uh, participants from the western africa and uh, there are other uh, participants from uh, other countries where tuna populations uh, are uh, one of the significant resource. So I hope that uh, the kind of um, uh, findings that I am going to present or the perspectives I am going to put forward will be useful uh, educationally as well as for your uh, any future uh, work purpose also. So I will start uh, directly with the presentation. I hope it is visible. So uh, this particular session uh, we will uh, cover about the some findings that we uh, uh, had uh, from the uh, telemetry program of the or tuna tagging that we have conducted in the northern Indian Ocean. So if you remember uh, yesterday's lecture and day before yesterday, there are different kind of telemetries and uh, if you have not visited uh, those lectures, you can visit those first. And if you are accessing this offline, uh, not live, then you can visit those lectures first and then you can uh, go through this talk so that uh, it will be easier for you to understand. So we uh, used the satellite tags and uh, I will not uh, dwell into uh, again the differences between acoustic tags and satellite tag but we preferred that because uh, this is the it is suitable for this uh, species so this is kind of a uh, nice album that uh, uh, summarizes the program and uh, I'll show you like what kind of data it gives us so during the journey of the fish uh, till when the tag is on the fish, it will collect uh, different kind of data. Here two parameters or two uh, types of um, uh, variables are plotted. One is the depth that gives us the idea about the diving patterns and uh, the depth you should read on the left hand axis. And uh, same uh, graph uh, I have plotted uh, temperature and temperature you should be reading the numbers on the right hand axis. So corresponding each of the timestamp uh, for the uh, each of the observations, you get uh, depth as well as uh, temperature in this graph. So you can see that uh, the fishes are like or this particular fish, uh, it has been diving uh, mainly up to 50 meter depth and uh, in initial part up to 100 meter as well. There are some deep dives recorded uh, say up to uh, 300 meters also. But those are not the continuous uh, recordings. So problem is that sometimes uh, if the fish has actually dived or it is just the anomaly in the sensor, it is difficult to know that. A typical dive will actually record the uh, depth uh, in uh, continuous progressive manner. So the depth is uh, increasing, increasing, increasing and then when the dive is completed, then depth should it, uh, decrease. However, uh, at the same time, uh, the temperature decrease that we see here confirms that the dives that plotted here are the actual dives. So you can see that corresponding temperature values also 
that uh, 20 degrees Celsius or 15 degrees Celsius. But then you can see that uh, the majority of the data are not in the like low temperature values. So in case of temperature, majority of the values are between 20 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius. And uh, the diving, uh, if you can see these green uh, circles on the left hand axis, those values are there for uh, 0 to 100 meter depth. Now, this is not just one fish that we tagged. So this is basically the idea about like to give you that how uh, wide our tagging program was. So you can see there are two batches. One batch had the light sensor on that. Another batch did not have the light sensor. Again, I'm not going to get into the details about the type of the tags and what is the light sensor or what is its importance. Uh, either it is covered in the previous lectures or the technical details in deep we will be covering in the uh, future uh, version or iterations of this course which will be uh, kind of advanced level. So here uh, two batches were there, one batch with without light sensor, another batch with the light sensor. So the batch two with light sensor uh, we can also get the movement and uh, we can, we can uh, cre recreate the tracks. And these are all findings that is already published and uh, for each of the graphs or plots that I'm going to show uh, in this particular uh, presentation, the uh, digital uh, object identification or the unique number for the paper that is cited below, that is also put there. So you can simply go to Google Scholar and copy this uh, whole thing or just the DUI and you can just, or you can Google the DUI and you can reach to the particular uh, publication if you are interested to read in detail. So coming back to the tagging program, we had been tagging the fishes on the east coast as well as the west coast of India. And as you can see that our uh, uh, effort were uh, mostly equally balanced for both sides of the basin, Arabian Sea as well as the Bay of Bengal. And uh, there are uh, locations where we tagged the fish. There are locations plotted where the tag was detached from the fish and came to surface and started reporting. So this gi also gives you the idea on uh, that uh, the tagging was uh, done near to the coast where all the triangles are there downward. And the circles are where uh, the tags were uh, actually they popped off or they, they detached from the fish. So. With that background, I will just uh, directly come to the temperature preference. So this temperature is not the sea surface temperature as you can see from the satellite. This is the temperature that uh, the tags have recorded. So for example, uh, in the first slide, the kind of corresponding to that depth, whatever temperature was recorded by the tag that is being plotted here. But this is for all the fishes in the group of uh, like say Arabian Sea or Bay of Bengal that put together because we are studying a species and not an individual. So if you need to understand the preference of a species, you have many individuals, maybe in uh, one basin or the other. So basin wise, you can then group the data. And also the data are grouped at every one degree Celsius interval. So to get the idea that, okay, what are the you know ambient temperatures in which the fishes were swimming in general for that basin. And there is a logic also in uh, uh, grouping for the basins because no two basins or no two seas or the oceans are uh, uh, exactly same. So you can see the, uh, there are slight differences even though both the basins of the northern Indian Ocean are in, at the same latitude, they both are in tropic, they both are landlocked from north. Uh, the temperature reference in the Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal are not exactly same when it comes to the swimming habits of tuna. So maximum of the temperature uh, that is uh, like being encountered ambient temperature for the tunas in the and I would like to clarify here we have not been tagging all tuna species or different tuna species we had only tagged yellowfin tuna. So when I say tuna during this talk uh, it means yellowfin tuna of the northern Indian Ocean. So for the Arabian Sea you can see that maximum of the time 
and that corresponds to the up, up to 50% of the data that is corresponding to the uh, temperature values around 29 degrees Celsius that follows by the 30 degrees Celsius with 22% of the data so the data labels are the percentage of the data so for example you have the 10,000 uh, total observations half of the observations are at 29 degrees Celsius in the Arabian Sea similarly whatever data for the fishes that were tagged in the Bay of Bengal you can see that the highest uh, temperature records are corresponding to the 28 degrees Celsius but then you can uh, see that either of the basin if you see uh, if you club all the data between 27 to 30 degrees Celsius it actually corresponds to almost 90 percent of the data okay and uh, in general if you want to compare this data with the uh, swimming behavior in the Atlantic or Pacific then uh, all the uh, all the tags data combined this is the like uh, uh, grouping that is there in the below panel so this is the uh, idea about uh, this uh, like what are the temp ambient temperature preferences not the sea surface temperature uh, for the fishes now similar to that when we have a diving pattern because I have shown you the temperature and depth data similar meaning if we do for the depths if you see here that for the Arabian Sea and for the Bay of Bengal and you can see that uh, there are some uh, like pillars you can see that there are also there is a line with uh, some diamonds are there for all the graphs so the way you read this is that for each of the 10 meter depth binning how much of the data percentage it is there it is shown on the uh, on the uh, left hand axis so for example for the Arabian Sea Basin 1 meter to 10 meter depth almost 22% uh, of the data was there and uh, 10 to 20 meter depth range 12% uh, of the data it was falling into that and so on and so forth now uh, there are some data labels on the top of the pillars but that corresponds to these diamonds that is shown there uh, on the cumulative frequency cumulative frequency is that that uh, how much total percentage of the data that is there uh, uh, for any 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 of these steps so for example cumulative frequency for and that you read on the right hand side axis so again for the Arabian Sea example if I give the 1 to 10 meter range depth it will show you like uh, the cumulative frequency stands at 22 but then when you go for 10 to 20 uh, meter range then it is not a cumulative frequency uh, same as just 12% uh, but previous 22 and uh, 12 added to that why because then you get the idea that okay up to 20 meter depth how many data records are there and why it is important is that that as you keep on adding that you will understand that by a, if you reach up by 80 meter uh, total of the 77% uh, of the data it falls uh, within like okay so in other words 77% uh, of the time when the observations were made through the tag uh, 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 fishes were at 80 meter depth or less than that similarly 90% data it is reaching by 110 uh, meter depth 96% data that is the 95 threshold it is crossed by when you reach up to 130 meter depth so you can say that uh, out of every 100 observations made by the tag 95 were at the depth 130 or less than that in the meters and 99 percentage of the data it is by 160 meters in the Arabian Sea similar numbers are there for the Bay of Bengal and the again Indian Sea is combined I'm not going to read that take home message is that that maximum of the uh, time it is spent between uh, maximum up to 80 to 100 meter depends on the basin but then that is the majority of the data is there so it is more like a shallow diving now this contrasts basically uh, in uh, when, when compared to the previous work that is done uh, in the Atlantic or Pacific 
where regular dives up to 300 meters it has been observed so this is something uh, a unique behavior is there and uh, we need we, we were we were intrigued why it is happening because why they are not diving deep and as we can, we have seen that the temperatures are uh, still favorable so for tuna it is told that uh, tuna can actually maintain the core body temperature up to 8 degrees celsius higher also than the ambient temperature and because of that capability tunas can actually dive in uh, very cold water without uh, you know uh, being uh, afraid of uh, their uh, metabolism being affected or the like physiology that is getting arrested so why it is not happening here this is all in tropic very high temperatures are there so they don't need not to worry about the like you know cold water encounters also so this is uh, again uh, for the arabian sea and bay of bengal uh, depth distribution but now this is uh, day versus night so during day what day time stamps what was the behavior during night what was the behavior and you can see there is some uh, diurnal signal is there but it is not very significant since the uh, dive pattern itself it is restricted up to 100 meter depth so you can see that uh, it is little bit more stretched in arabian sea than bay of bengal as we have seen in the previous slide and in the bay of bengal there is a, a slightly more prominent uh, you know uh, zone of 50 to 70 meter is there uh, for the swimming during day time during night time it shallows significantly for arabian sea night time it is significant but day time again the distribution is uh, like a broad so there is no like a single peak in that so this is what we understand uh, after tagging and when you compare their movement uh, with reference to the surface parameters uh, as it is observed uh, uh, through the satellite because that is the main understanding at the operational scale when you want to do the like a proper fisheries resource management or you want to create some policies you will rely on the tools like a uh, satellite data because every time you will not get the ambient temperature or at depth data in real time so when we see the sea surface temperature as it is being recorded by the satellite there is no like a uh, uh, you know significant uh, gaussian distribution it is more like a uh, bimodal but uh, one of those peaks are suppressed so the higher side uh, temperature it is suppressed and the lower temperature there is uh, another peak which is more prominent that leaves uh, things more confusing because uh, uh, like uh, it is reported in the other basins that if the tuna has the strong affinities towards the fronts and uh, it is true for the other basins if that is here you would expect that if tunas are uh, you know uh, like uh, swimming across the fronts either side they will encounter cold and warm both waters and you will get uh, two prominent peaks so a perfect bimodal distribution you would expect but that is not what you are getting here on the other hand when you plot the movement with reference to sea level anomaly or in other terms sea surface height anomaly you get a very nice uh, gaussian distribution that basically tells us that uh, tuna prefers to stay in the uh, neutral sea level anomaly zones neither towards the very extreme of the either side positive or negative sea level anomaly and if you recall your previous lectures uh, of the satellite oceanography or uh, the marine processes the eddies either warm core or cold core are having uh, like either extreme uh, uh, positive or negative sea level anomaly so here it tells us that uh, tuna stays in the periphery of those regions where sea level anomaly is more or less neutral and uh, this is not uh, like a random uh, some of the observations but 70 percentage of the time it stays uh, between this uh, periphery of the convergence or divergence zone so uh, this is uh, what uh, when we, we plot the data movement data of the fish with reference to the satellite data we get this kind of uh, uh, distribution 
and you can see the fitting values also in case of uh, temperature it is less good fit in case of uh, sea level animal it is better fit and this can be substantiated uh, with uh, like ground truthing data that we have uh, from the uh, like uh, uh, fisherman feedback also so whether we have like uh, some observations it goes along with the what is being observed in case of fishing or that is not the same case but as we can see that here in terms of temperature as well as sea level anomaly when we plot the good uh, fish catch data it also corroborates to the like observations so that uh, then requires more of a uh, investigation that why it is so here is another example of such uh, feedback where uh, good fish catch what was reported and uh, they actually found to be in the the zone found to be in the uh, neutral sea level anomaly region so little recap to that uh, marine processes if you are having upwelling then uh, there will be like a divergence it will create and sea level anomaly will be in the negative manner if you have a uh, downwelling then the thermocline will actually be deepened and then it will be like a convergence zone where sea level anomaly will be positive so with that reference there are uh, some other studies even from incois itself that shows that indian ocean especially northern indian ocean is very unique because uh, thermocline and oxycline depths are actually go hand to hand in this region so even though it is true for other basins uh, the this kind of uh, empirical relationship can actually help you that okay you can uh, calculate confidently the oxycline depth if you have the sea level anomaly so this paper that i have cited here below that is not the same paper i mentioned earlier but with this doi you can get that uh, other paper which shows the method on how to get the oxycline depth by using the sea level data so i will uh, show some of the results uh, based on the tagging so here i am showing some of the tracks or movement of the fish where uh, the uh, fishes were tagged so here there are some circles and there are some diamonds diamonds are there in the shades of yellow or orange so diamonds are not the tagging data that is from the bio argo and uh, when the slide comes i will remind you about the bio argo other circles are corresponding to different uh, fishes movement so fish movement it is shown as circles and uh, these are all like uh, from the deployment to the uh, end of the mission that will be a track so these are the tracks and along the track we then uh, uh, derived uh, like temperature as well as uh, temperature uh, profiles as well as the depth of the oxycline and this is how it looks like now if you see that in uh, with reference to the literature that is available from other basins tuna can uh, sustain the low water temperature even up to you know uh, like very very low temperature so that uh, it can it can dive deeper but here if you see that the movement of the tuna which is shown in the cyan line it is restricted for the temperature values mostly uh, more than 25 degrees celsius this pretty much the data that tag itself recorded so the temperature along along the track of the uh, fish movement if you plot that you can see that the uh, depth at which the fish is swimming below also there are uh, there is like a uh, relatively warm or moderate water is there for example there is some blue color is there which corresponds to the temperature values about 16 degrees celsius or 18 degrees celsius but then and which is not at all unusual for a tuna to to swim within but still it is not preferring to dive so basically something is stopping it to dive below that and uh, you can see that uh, when you when you when you plot oxycline depth you start getting some clues that okay 
it probably prefers to or avoids to uh, you know uh, breach the oxycline depth so oxycline depth is the depth below which lo very low oxygen waters are there because constant uh, air sea interaction if the surface water are having less oxygen immediately it will get dissolved from the atmosphere and vice versa so surface waters are never oxygen poor waters it is well oxygenated water along with the mixing processes throughout the mixed layer depth oxygen will be abundant oxycline depth is the depth at which the oxygen concentration starts depleting very fast and this is not only seen uh, behavior uh, as a behavior from the fishes that were attacked in the arabian sea but the same was there for the bay of bengal also at the best fishes were uh, at the oxycline depth where it was shallow as you can see from the top panel but then the depth itself was was never the like a uh, uh, you know below oxycline depth so for the arabian sea you can then i am going back one slide red line and black line it is uh, going hand to hand and wherever it is going hand to hand it says that uh, depth of 23 degrees celsius isotherm and oxycline depth it is uh, almost hand to hand in case of bay of bengal sometimes uh, 23 degrees celsius goes very uh, uh, deep and oxycline depth would be much much shallower than that as you can see on the top panel in such cases tuna prefer to stick more to the oxycline depth rather than the temperature uh, uh, even of if, if the warm temperature is available so this is the kind of point that i am trying to make that Uh, it is under it was understood that you know would prefer the thermocline and you know would uh, follow the thermocline depth but here we are seeing that it is more with the oxycline depth and why it would happen for that to understand we need to understand the physiology of the tuna as well as its evolutionary traits so this is the basic uh, life cycle of tuna so and uh, it is not like uh, unheard of or unknown for you probably so it is like external fertilization fertilization happens and then uh, eggs will be like uh, you know hatching then there will be larval stage then juveniles which are then uh, like uh, they they grow fast because uh, they are uh, feeding uh, literally you know very voraciously rightly put in this picture as well so they attain the size uh, of the sub adult very fast and then Uh, after that uh, they attain the sexual maturity and then the life cycle goes on so here the key term is eating voraciously and that is very characteristic of tuna as well so it has very high metabolic rates it requires to keep on feeding very fast and when you see the uh, the size of the body and what is the reserve capacity of the energy for almost all the uh, animal like uh, uh, life in the in the ocean there is a kind of a uh, like a proportionate uh, relationship is there so small fishes will have the small body size and small reserve capacity and then so on up to sharks and whales so then uh, like if the reserve body size increases reserve capacity for the energy also it will increase tunas are very unique as you can see they are like totally off the trend so they have the larger body size but that body size does not correspond to the large reserve capacity of the energy so what this means is that they need to keep on eating and uh, they are very fast swimmer so their net energy balance is in the negative side so they need to keep on eating they need to keep on hunting for that again they need to keep on swimming so that makes them more vulnerable to starvation if the food is not available and uh, these are like a high metabolic rates and high oxygen demands are because of evolution so here you can see the evolution chart of tuna where tuna fit into if you take time to find tuna here they are so the teleost when they branch out and then uh, tunas are within this scum breedy and why it is important to see this tree is that you also see in the geological time scale teleost is not the group that it is actually 
evolved very late and they in that uh, their their revolution time they have like exposed been exposed to the very low temperatures mass extinction events very low oxygen in the in the atmosphere and uh, as a result very low oxygen in the ocean water also so this all points to that they should have the like a uh, very good capacity in uh, like tolerating the low oxygen levels before going to the oxygen part i will just um, uh, say that what evolutionary uh, uh, process has done with the tuna it is called like a fish that only fish that behaves almost like a mammal a warm blooded fish like that it 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 shows the characteristics so like a mammal it has endothermic traits same thing that i uh, mentioned earlier that it can maintain the core body temperature even in the colder water so it will not freeze like a snake but it will behave like a, a mammal it will be able to maintain its core body temperature in the freezing waters and uh, for that it has uh, uh, something called counter current heat exchange i could go into biological details of that but that is the topic of the uh, next level of these courses so i'll just leave it as as a word here so these are the ecological adaptations uh, over the evolutionary period that has brought tunas to what they are right now and they are totally you know uh, custom made for uh, fast and surprising attack also including that uh, large artery reserves and larger gills so that they simply need uh, like a shot of oxygen then uh, immediately they can shoot uh, their speed and then they can just hunt even in the clear water on the other hand when it comes to the oxygen tolerance tolerance uh, kind of uh, limits what we expect from the evolutionary traits we expect that they will be able to uh, you know survive in the low oxygen waters very very long they do in fact as it is shown for example in this paper it is mentioned if you are interested you can read that so they created on board uh, a virtual uh, like swimming tanks in which the tunas will be more or less uh, static but then water will be flowing so that tuna will feel virtually that uh, they uh, tuna will feel that they are swimming but they are in the same location and then the researchers can record uh, them with the camera or other sensors attached to their body and then researchers can actually expose and they have done the same they have exposed the fishes to the various uh, different levels of the dissolved oxygen and seen their body response what is the heart rate what is the swimming speed what is the uh, mouth cavity opening uh, uh, rate and so on so that points out that they have the resilience as it is expected to the low oxygen water but they are also sensitive at the same time so what is the sensitivity called resilience first of all resilience means that they can survive they will not die in the low oxygenated waters but then they are sensitive to low oxygenated waters why because if you expose them to low oxygen water again immediately if you expose they will be vulnerable they require some time to recover and then they again can be exposed to the low oxygen waters so that is the limitation because it is not like they will not survive but then at the cost of recovery so for example if uh, a tuna it is forced to find a food because otherwise there is no other motivation for going into the uh, deeper waters which are uh, low oxygenated right so if the tuna is uh, hunting the uh, fishes which are small in size which are forage fish the forage fish does not have very uh, high oxygen demands to escape tuna they may dive and then they may go to the low oxygen water tuna can follow them but then after uh, getting the food they may have to come back to the uh, well ventilated or oxygenated waters where dissolved oxygen is uh, uh, at the good uh, concentrations right so when i talk about the oxygenated waters and low oxygenated water it mean to say that uh, i'll go with the oxycline depth definition from uh, Uh, the the paper that i have shown earlier they have taken it uh, for the arabian sea and for the uh, bay of bengal that is uh, at the 50 uh, uh, ppb 
and for the uh, like uh, equatorial Indian Ocean that value will be definition of oxycline um, depth would be 125 but here uh, for such low oxygen waters if the tuna had to dive to that it has to then bounce back to the well ventilated waters where the values are uh, at higher than 50 so until unless there is no necessity tuna would prefer to not to go dive for that uh, uh, such low oxygen waters so this is like a, you can assume that tunas are taking a long gasp <gasps> like that and then uh, they are just uh, diving to the low oxygen water if there is a requirement either for the hunting or for their survival if uh, there is a shark behind them and then they will have to stay there but then after coming again they cannot perform the same thing immediately they require some time to recover so that their uh, blood oxygen also will come back to the normal level and to extend that further now I it is time to remember that map in which I shown uh, those uh, yellow or orange diamonds and I mentioned about the bio argo those bio argo are fitted with the sensor that gives you the chlorophyll concentration and those were in the vicinity of those uh, tuna movements now you can see that those bio argos uh, actually plotted the deep chlorophyll maxima which is about 60 to 80 meters in case of uh, uh, southern bay of bengal and in case of uh, uh, equatorial indian ocean it is 80 to 100 meters so tuna is not uh, the uh, herbivore fish it might not be interested in the phytoplankton directly but the forage fish which tuna actually uh, targets if they are concentrated in the deep chlorophyll maxima region or subsurface chlorophyll maxima what you call uh, the way you call it so in that region if the forage fish is available tuna has no motivation to dive further than 100 meter depth so that clarifies that it prefers to stay in the well ventilated waters it need not to go to low oxygen waters if the food itself is available above the oxycline depth now this seems like a good summary but then it changes our whole understanding of what is the like a uh, uh, physiology of the tuna and uh, how the oceanographic preferences also change so earlier uh, it was understood that anywhere above the thermocline uh, tuna can freely swim but with the sea level data and uh, with the oxycline depth uh, it seems like there are uh, natural and narrow corridors or tunnels in the ocean that is having a three dimensional shape in which only tuna will migrate so you see the like uh, area that is available for tuna earlier it was believed in the upper panel and now you can see that with this uh, new understanding that uh, how much less area it is available as a habitat for the tunas so if the same stock it is compressed into such virtual tunnels their catchability will increase exponentially the pressure for the fishing also will increase to them exponentially because if the fishermen are finding them in some regions it is the region where most of the tuna are like again getting aggregated and cramped in so there are chance there are high chances for the over exploitation and this situation may deteriorate day by day why i will just explain uh, in few slides before closing this talk you can see the northern Indian Ocean it is unique it is unique because it is the probably only uh, region of the world oceans where such low uh, dissolved oxygens are available so here the color it is shown as a, uh, a depth depth of what so the like uh, 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 you can see on the right hand side there is axis and that shows the depth number so 0 to 200 meter depth 200 to 400 400 to 600 and up to 1400 meter uh, deep also for what then the number is that 60 micromole per liter okay so where the oxygen is uh, 60 micromole per liter so like i shown uh, or, or talked in the previous slide that for the northern indian ocean the oxycline depth which we defined it is 50 micromole per liter so that it is bet between 0 to 200 meters so northern indian ocean is the only region uh, like i said 
now you will say that uh, it is not the, it is not true because uh, in the pacific also in the eastern pacific there are such regions but then the tuna population in the pacific it is uh, mostly concentrated in the equatorial western pacific so i'll show on the cursor here that these are the shallow low oxygen regions because of the upwelling but the tuna population in the pacific it is mostly in this region and yesterday i have shown some uh, migration of the tuna so that migration actually happens on the uh, uh, you can say subtropical or temperate region so tuna habitat it is not falling in this low oxygenated waters whether in case of northern indian ocean the whole tuna population that we studied it is falling under this low oxygen waters so northern indian ocean can actually serve as a natural laboratory or if you prefer to call it time machine because what we see today in the northern indian ocean it is more like projection for the other basins in future because if you can see that uh, this is the like uh, oxygen lows uh, in the uh, world oceans and you can see that southern atlantic which is as per the previous graph it is not the low oxygen water the oxygen loss is very high same goes for the uh, equatorial uh, western pacific where the tuna populations live or subtropical or temperate uh, eastern pacific region which are not low oxygenated waters right now but the oxygen loss is very high without any significant oxygen loss uh, these are the northern indian ocean basins are already uh, low oxygen water itself so you can safely say that what uh, tuna pref uh, behave uh, in in the northern indian ocean would be their behavior in the other basins in uh, future say after 50 years and this is uh, already uh, being projected by many researchers so as the oxygen minimum zones that is called omzs they expand the habitat would decrease so this paper uh, from uh, astrama they, that was uh, uh, published in year 2011 after that uh, this study that was published by us uh, last year was the first one that shown uh, from this national laboratory of the northern indian ocean that uh, the kind of projection that the researchers have given uh, that is actually uh, the present behavior of the uh, high trophic level predator like uh, tuna and that would be the uh, future for tuna population in the other basins as well so with this uh, i end uh, this talk the relationship between physiology and oceanography giving the example of tuna my colleague uh, saurav has already covered like uh, two other species so this uh, summarizes so those were the like uh, anadromous and herbivore species this is the example of the carnivore species so how their movement their future their habitat their catchability their conservation or uh, uh, sustainable exploitation effort everything is related to the uh, their oceanography preference so if you have any question i will take that now
Okay, we have one question. How does the wind and wave affect this upwelling nature? So basically, winds play important role. So wind wave are the local phenomena. So waves are just a result of that. But in general, the uh, wind, especially alongshore wind, that uh, actually, uh, what should I say? It induces the upwelling. So in the mid mid ocean, there may not be much because that is like a, it is uh, the the upwelling or the divergence that is being driven with the mesoscale processes such as eddy formation and geostrophic currents movement. But for the coastal region, the winds will actually induce uh, the upwelling so that the cooler and uh, nutrient rich but uh, often the low oxygen concentrated uh, concentration dissolved oxygen water also will reach uh, close to the surface. Next question is does tuna has a specific behavior with reference to temperature salinity? Salinity so far uh, no uh, significant studies are there. Temperature yes other uh, basins and even in the Indian Ocean uh, there are some uh, studies and it might be applicable for uh, uh, like Equatorial Indian Ocean or Southern Indian Ocean but in the Northern Indian Ocean as I shown uh, it is more it seems like uh, less of the temperature affinity and more of a behavior to stay above the oxycline depth. How can we increase oxygen levels naturally to conserve the fish for future? Actually these are the complex uh, processes at the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, global scale and uh, it is not uh, as such uh, in our hand but overall the goals for the arresting the uh, uh, global warming or the uh, rapid climate change because we cannot say that we will stop climate change climate cannot be stopped changing it is ever changing phenomena but at the rate it is changing that gives very less time evolutionary for the uh, any of the species whether it is on land or in the ocean for them to cope up with so that uh, uh, the way we have influenced the rate of the climate change uh, from our side uh, uh, these are the impacts that we are seeing even if it is not in front of our eyes it is beneath these uh, uh, ocean water but it is still affecting so climate change does not only affect to the corals but it also affects to the very highly mo uh, movable like or mo uh, uh, high mo migratory species like tuna also so we may think that like trees corals have nothing to escape so that when the climate change and global warming affects them they simply because they are static they don't have any mobility option they are being affected but that is not correct for highly mobile uh, uh, species like tuna also uh, still they fall uh, you know victim of the uh, these changes thermocline and oxycline goes hand in hand as you said but it's true always as oxycline may also be dependent on chlorophyll event and upwelling so uh, uh, when we talk about the oxycline depth it is true that uh, a photosynthesis as a result of that oxygen will be uh, produced and probably that is the logic behind this uh, question but then uh, we should remember that the phytoplankton that they do the photosynthesis and as a result they produce the oxygen also respire so if a phytoplankton bloom is there it will uh, convert uh, you know uh, car dissolved carbon dioxide to food and as a result it may produce oxygen molecules but then there will be respiration and as the phytoplankton bloom will be there there will be a support for higher trophic level also for example zooplankton which will again not only uh, you, you know uh, like a, uh, conduct any photosynthesis but only respiration so basically net oxygen balance it is not uh, because of these uh, biological uh, factors uh, in compared to that uh, mixing lead uh, uh, maintenance of the or ventilation of the um, at least mixed layer waters it is very very uh, prominent and that is where it, it, it plays uh, the role also 
when the uh, bloom crashes or the like organic matter whether it is from the phytoplankton or the zooplankton or the fish all the re remnants when it sinks so if you remember your uh, uh, first day lecture on the biogeochemistry when all the organic matter actually when it sinks it starts getting degraded by the bacteria that time also oxygen will be consumed and that is the reason that the uh, deeper waters uh, it has uh, most of the oxygen is consumed so uh, yeah i mean uh, uh, it is other way around that uh, since the nutrient is available and then since deep chlorophyll maxima it is uh, in the uh, you know shallower depths uh, subsurface chlorophyll maxima is at the shallower depths uh, that is where the fishes are uh, aggregating and you know uh, target to that but that does not affect or uh, determine the oxycline depth i hope that answers the question next so we'll wait for 2 to 3 minutes uh, for uh, next questions else we end uh, this session and if you still have the question you have the like email id given that is my email id and uh, you can email me so for any of the doubts that are not answered uh, live during this lecture while we await for the questions uh, i would repeat some of the announcements that we made earlier that uh, all the registered participants will be sent a link for an online test uh, after the end of the course and uh, those who submit uh, the right answers they will be given e certificate of that e certificate is important for enrollment of the uh, next levels of this course which we will conduct later part of this year so this is the basic level course basic uh, level batch 1 was conducted in uh, last november this is the second batch but at the same basic level and there will be one or two more uh, basic level uh, batches will be there all these batches out of that those who could uh, uh, secure the e certificate uh, will be eligible to uh, will be eligible to enroll or register for the uh, intermediate or advanced level of the course that we will announce in future so that is the reason that uh, you should be you should be uh, attempting the test doing it successfully and you should also keep an eye for the future courses so that any of your colleagues who could not register you can actually uh, convey them that the next course uh, basic course has been announced and they can also register that time so this time uh, we have conveyed the or uh, announcement of the course of batch 2 to all those who attended batch 1 so now you are also part of that alumni pool and uh, along with the batch 1 and batch 2 when we announce uh, batch 3 of the basic course we will inform you by email so that you can pass it on to others so with this uh, we are ending this question and answer session and uh, i hope you found it useful and intriguing and uh, you can look forward uh, for more reading on these topics and uh, participate in the uh, future